Yep. Once it's live. Okay, here we go. I know there is a little bit of a delay, so like, yeah, we got 20, 25 seconds when you use uh, on the news that when you use uh, Zoom, Zoom. twenty twenty five seconds approximately. Yeah. But we're on, we're on, Frank. We are on. Uh, yeah, wonderful, incredible. Okay, let me let me hit the uh, share button so that people don't have to be stuck looking at our hideous faces. Yeah, tell go. me about it with me, especially I got this. Uh, no background that i need to change and it look like it's all light <laughs> no brother it's all good i'm just joking around we are live thank the good lord and we're going to continue doing what we began we started off last week let me hit the share sound we're going to continue in fact we left off right here at the 14 minute mark and before i um, just telling the audience before we were going to start with prayer but i think people have already noticed that this guy has been tuning into our sessions. In fact, one thing, I don't know if Sam knows this, but he has also tuned in to other shows that I'm doing. So he's watching stuff we do. Uh, Hopefully yeah. he's learning. But the brother Jeremy, I think Jeremy and Arthur, mm -hmm. they said that his channel, a lot of people that have been watching us have been going over there and he's automatically banning them. So... Well, that's fine. I mean, uh, there's a difference between banning trolls yep. that come there and just mock and bash and ridicule and won't debate. But it's another thing to, ba you know, to ban people that are calling you out with facts that you can't refute. See, I don't tolerate trolls on my channel that will come and yep. bash and mock and ridicule. And then when I say come to Skype, don't because what happens, there's one disadvantage. I'm going to let people know. I don't know if my screen is good here. I'll probably have to move. But one disadvantage, the comment section can be overrun by trolls who yep. post 50,000 comments with 50,000 words because they got nothing else to do. Yep, they have no and life. So I don't allow that. I don't allow that in my channel. If you really think you have something to say to prove your point, you can come on my Skype. And if you can control yourself and respect yourself and not get loud and avoid issues, I've proven it. I've got many debates and discussions where I've proven it. You can go watch. I will be anything but respectful and patient with people if they are able to respect themselves and not ridicule and keep to the topic. But if you start bashing, then I give you a taste of your own medicine. Yep. So no so doubt, brother. This guy, he doesn't refute anything. He can't refute anything because yeah. we put holes through every argument. Now he's gone to attacking because you mentioned it to me. I don't watch his stuff. The Old Testament, which we'll get into eventually, God willing. Now, this comes from a guy, remember, he's a Catholic. He used to be a Catholic. And he didn't know the answers to these. I don't know. Let me go sit on a table so my picture comes out better. You got it, brother. Not a problem. Yeah, uh, for people, and, and, and I could be wrong, but my opinion is that he's a liar. He is a uh, Muslim deceiver. I, I personally, I've had people tell me, William, uh, we think that he was a Catholic at one point. I don't think he's ever been um, a Christian, ever, period. I don't think. And I think once we see the rest of this video today, which, by the way, Sam, brother, you made a great point. We'll deal with this Old Testament stuff later because I want people to realize one thing. Look, we're at the 14 and a half minute mark. There's four minutes left, but it's going to take a whole session just to unpack the garbage he's going to throw at the screen. You're going to, people are going to notice that. So we'll have to deal with the Old Testament stuff later, but people be edified, pay attention. You're going to realize today what a total fraud this man is. And I want people to realize one thing. Sam has not seen the rest of the video. I don't watch him. I don't watch him. And yep. FYI, the reason I just want to add this and guys, we're going to get into topic, but we do need prayer because yep. today was a little rough for me, but the Lord Jesus is merciful and he is faithful. May he give us the power to be faithful. And as long as we're cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, we're okay and filled with spirit. But here's why I say he's not, he was not a Catholic. If you were a Catholic and you were watching these Muslim videos, then your first reaction, because he didn't find these Muslims in his local mosque, he found them online, Ahmadidat, Zakir Naik. Then his first reaction would have been, to see if there are Christians responding to them online. Don't tell me that when you do Ahmadi Dat, you won't find David Wood's videos or my videos or someone else come up because usually when you go to YouTube, they have recommended videos that 
address similar themes. So if he was really a Catholic, his first reaction would be, let me find answers because I believe my Catholic faith is true. You wouldn't immediately assume it's false and then jump the bandwagon. The fact that he knows Zachar Naik, Paul Sonamite Williams, Zachar uh, Ahmed Idad, he knows most of the Muslim polemicists that even Christians who are engaging Muslims are not aware of. How many people know about Paul Williams? Ahmed Idad, the world knows, Zachar Naik. But that tells you this guy is a deceiver. And don't forget, folks, John 8, 44. John 8, 44 tells us, if you belong to the devil, if you belong to Satan, and <clears throat> you are under his influence and control, you will act like your father. Because he says, you seek to carry out the desires of your father. He was a liar and a murderer. So don't be surprised those who are under demonic influence or belong to the devil. They bear the fruits of their father, the devil, liars, deceivers, and murderers, which perfectly pegs Muhammad and the Quran. Muhammad murdered people. He assassinated people. He raped women. He molested women. He prostituted women. He married a minor. And in his religion, there are verses in the Quran where Muslims are allowed to lie and deceive. And I give you the verses. We'll do a show on it. And one of the names of his God, one of the names of Muhammad's God is Khairun Makarin. One of the, uh, let me explain what Khairun Makarin is. Khairun Makarin means the best of all deceivers. Makar means to deceive, to connive, to cheat. And in the Quran, chapter 3, verse 54, Allah said to be Khairun Makarin, the best of all deceivers. And I even have a commentary by Qurtubi where he had Muslims praying, Oh, you who are the best of all deceivers considering it to be one of his names. So that tells you right there. Yep. Now that, that tells you everything, brother. You're, you're hundred percent correct there. And uh, you're right. If he, he, these are bad arguments. These are really, really bad arguments. He's a deceiver. He's a liar. And by the way, brother, even though I doubt it'll happen uh, a few days ago, uh, we got challenged by some, as usual, anonymous that goes by the name Constantine. He affirmed that he would be showing up with who knows who else. When? Doubt it. Today. He claimed it would be today. Please make our day. I doubt it. As usual, I doubt it. But hey, I have posted right here in the description of the video. The Zoom link is there. Come on in. And folks, you're in for a treat. Those of you who stay up late in America, announce it. I've already scheduled it on my YouTube channel. So guys, go there and share it on your social media pages because tonight, now the time will be... It will be uh, 2 a.m. New York time, 2 a.m. New York time, which is Michigan time, which is Eastern Standard Time. So if I'm 11 p.m. and yeah, so 12, 1, 2, yeah. 2 a.m., which for Europe will be afternoon. England yeah. will be like 8, 9 in the morning. So the Europeans won't be late for them. I'm going to prove tonight, guys. Announce it, please. I want you to take the link, go to your social media, media pages, let people know. I'm going to be reviewing Shabir Ali's debate with Matt Slick yesterday. They had a debate on Deity of Christ. Really? I'm going to prove Shabir Ali is now officially apostate. He said something in the debate that no Muslim can ever support him again. He denies ex nihilo. He doesn't believe creation. Oh, wow. Yeah, he did in debate. So, wow. guy, I'm going to expose him, and I want people to make clips out of that part where in the debate with Matt Slick, he pretty much <clears throat> rejects ex nihilo, where creation was brought into being from nothing. He actually argued in order to get away from a yeah. point that Matt Slick slammed him on. He had to get away from arguing that the creation has a beginning, but that the creation is eternal. And I'm going to share it. And I want you guys, once I go live tonight, you hear that, make a clip out of it from the debate. Shabir Ali, apostate. He not only goes against what the Bible and historic church has taught, God brought creation to being from nothing. He goes against the Quran. He goes against Orthodox Islam in denying that creation came into being, into existence from nothing, because he argued for creation being eternally existent with Allah. So if you're in for a treat tonight. It's already scheduled. Please share it on your social media pages. Come and let's make that session go viral. Pray for William and I to be filled with the Spirit, washed in the holy blood of the Lord Jesus, and that the Lord Jesus will crucify our flesh and our lust. So come on, guys.
Amen, brother. Amen. That, you got a good crowd. You got nearly 400 so far. What's up with you, man? You're getting all bro, these crowds. Brother, I got to say, is he being forced to reinvent Islam because he's yes. back is against the wall? Wow. Yes. He's, it's amazing what he's doing to Islam. And guys, I don't know if you know this. If Shabir Ali was in an Islamic state, he would be asked to repent or he'd be killed as a, a hypocrite, apostate, a murtad, munafik, hypocrite. He would be killed in an Islamic state. If this guy went around spewing what he's spewing, he would have been killed. He would have been killed as a renegade, apostate, a hypocrite. Unbelievable. I will share that also on my uh, on my social media, brother. So tonight is when they're going to go live. Yeah, because I, I'm tomorrow morning, uh, Thursday. Oh, I yeah. Have to finish part two, God willing, of Daniel's timeline. I did part one. I laid the foundation to prepare people. I gave them materials where Daniel, by supernatural inspiration, revelation of the Holy Spirit, gives us the precise time that the real Messiah was to show up. What would happen to him? And I'm going to demonstrate historically, Jesus showed up exactly in the time given by Daniel, proving he is the real Messiah and that the Bible is supernatural and the God of the Bible is real. Amen. And brother, you, before we begin with prayer, I don't know if you want to tell the audience as well. I think yes. Friday you're going to be going live. You're going to be doing something with the brother yes, Al-Fadi, right? Al-Fadi, guys, uh, tomorrow his conference starts. Al-Fadi's conference, you have to go to Sira International. He's got a conference that will be beginning Thursday and I think will be terminating over the weekend where he has three tracks and he's got Christians speaking on all different tracks. And I'll be speaking yep. on the Friday track on how to use the Quran and evangelism to Muslims. Now, I don't know the time, so you got to go to his website, go to his website. You can sign up. You can join. Jay Smith will be speaking. Anthony Rogers, some heavy hitters. And by the way, brother, share with us your experience with Al Fadi, because you and Father Kappas were invited to speak on his yep. <clears throat> live stream. How'd that go? Now, that went fantastic, brother. The response has been great. Uh, we went on there with Father Kappas, by the way, incredible presentation where he was connecting the ancient sources and the material of Christ as angel of the Lord. Of course, I brought that in. I brought that together with the early patristic witness, oh, the yeah. early witness from the early councils. People really were edified, brother, and we really had a really good time. Um, but, um, uh, but yeah, we, and, and no, 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 but, uh, and we look forward to being back with him. It was great. And, uh, he was great. He was very, very gracious. It was a lot of fun, brother. Amen. Glory to the triune God. So whoever wants to pray, we're ready, brother. Let me know. Let me go ahead and, uh, four more minutes left in his video. Excuse me. Oh yeah. That's it. Okay, yeah. okay. So he does short responses to us. Uh, the final two, the final four minutes are, are a massive mess. Okay. There's another video. The other video is on the Old Testament. There's another yeah, we'll, video. We'll deal that. We'll, but, we'll uh, decimate his attacks on the Old Testament. We'll see. We'll see. I will warn you before we get to where I'm talking about so you don't fall over in laughter. Yeah. But uh, let's begin anyway. We'll begin with in the name of the Father, and the Son, Holy Spirit. Lord, please guide us tonight. Allow us to speak the truth that can be found in your inerrant word. Allow, us to, allow all light to shine forth. Allow those that are trapped and stuck in darkness to hear your word the word of God, and to be illuminated, to be brought to the truth that can be only found in our triune God. Allow those that are stuck in darkness to hear the truth, to come to know our incarnate God, our Lord and Savior, to come to know the truth of the Trinitarian faith. We ask this in your name, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, let's begin. Let's go, brother. Here we go. Uh, we got the sound going. And uh, let's hear the rest of his uh, delusional attacks. Okay. Come crashing down, you know, the drain. Well, you can actually read the book of John, chapter 14, verse 26. The Father is greater than I. This is another strong statement that makes a clear distinction between Jesus and God the Father. You want to address now, that? that? Yep. Yep. Okay. And it's not John 14, 26. It's John 14, 28. You yep. made a mistake. Okay, <laughs> yep. so first mistake, it's not John 14, 26. That's where Jesus talks about the Father sending the paraclete, the spirit of truth, in the name of Jesus Christ to indwell, empower the holy apostles. It's John 14, 28. And again, as our brother prayed, we asked the spirit to crucify our flesh, forgive us, and give us power to overcome our flesh, to walk in the light of the spirit in holiness and purity, 
washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, and I ask the Spirit for a supernatural anointing on us to speak the truth clearly and recall the scriptures perfectly for the glory of Jesus Christ. And I pray everyone will be blessed there. You know, I, I'm very, very blessed when I see my brother, sisters supporting our brother, William. He's alive because you got about 400 and I'm blessed. I love Amen. that. May your numbers increase for the glory of Jesus. Awesome. Okay. Amen, brother. Let's see what John, this one, this is why I said, if he was really a Catholic, if you put in, yep. in the YouTube right now, if you put in John 14, 28, father is greater than I, I suspect the video I did in a studio recorded by david wood will pop up. in fact brother can you confirm my yeah. system just go to you to put john 14 28 father greater than i will it recommend it was about a 12 minute session i did we were at abn studios david look wood at that do look at that number two second one look at that second one right yep so i wasn't lying right actually look brother you come up two out of the top four that come up we got catholic answers and then yours comes up uh, he could have easily found a video that had a, a, a solid reply. You see? So you guys see it? Well, I'm the second one. This I did years ago when David, uh, David Wood and I used to do the Jesus or Muhammad shows for ABN. We were in the studio and he said, let's do a short response to John 14, 28. And then you see Al Fadi's YouTube channel, Sir International, John 14, 28, Scripture Twisting 101. You don't even need to put my name. All you need to do, John 14, 28, Father greater than I, and YouTube recommends the responses I've done and others have done. How is it as a Catholic who supposedly believed in his faith vigorously because he went to seminary, he found the Muslims. He found Zachar Naik, Ahmed Idad, Paul the Sodomite Williams, but he didn't find these responses. Can someone help me understand? I, I don't get it, but we know because... His father is the devil until unless he repents because Muhammad is a son of the devil and Antichrist who's burning in hell under the feet of Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's deal with this, even though we've de dealt with this umpteenth times. I mean, man, I, I don't know how many times I've had to address this since I've entered full time ministry. So in John 14, 28, let's open it up. You don't even need to know Greek. Uh, it, the English word greater itself. Uh, the Greek word is my zone. Yep. But that you don't even need to know that. The Greek word, like the English word, greater, can have one of several meanings. One, it can mean, hey, God is greater than me because he's my creator. He's almighty. I'm not. I'm a finite creature, limited, temporal. So he is better and infinitely higher than me, right? So because his essence is different from mine, I'm greater than my dog in the eyes of God because my value as a creature who bears the image of God makes me better and greater than a dog in the sight of God who created me and dogs. So there's that sense of being greater ontologically. I don't mean to use fancy terms, but I want my brothers and sisters to understand this. Yeah. Ontology, meaning you're greater in your being and in your self-worth. I'm greater than a dog in my being and self-worth in the eyes of the creator. Now, if you don't have God, and if you're this materialistic, naturalistic atheist, no, what makes you better than a dog? Nothing. You get it? But I'm talking about from a theistic perspective, and he's a theist, right? Even though he worships a false god. But then there's the sense of being greater in rank, position, but not in essence and nature. So my boss is greater than me. The president is greater than me. William is greater than his children. Not in essence, not in ontology, not in nature, and value because William, his children, my boss and president I, we all possess a common human nature that makes us equal in value and essence in the sight of the creator because every one of us are image bearers of God. So greater cannot mean William is better in nature, dignity than his children. Impossible because that's just not yep. biblical. So in the context, we must determine whether... Jesus is saying the Father is greater than me, not just in rank, but in ontology, being of a superior essence because I'm just a creature and I'm finite limited. Or does he mean by virtue of his status on earth? Because don't forget, Jesus is on earth. He's about to be handed over. This is the night of his betrayal. Remember the context. He's about to be handed over to be beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death where his back 
the skin is back, hangs a shred, shredded paper from the whipping, spit upon, has a crown of thorns put on his head, mocked, ridiculed, nailed to the cross where he's going to be gasping for and dying. This is the context in which Jesus says, the Father is greater than I. Okay, so keep that in mind. So we're going to determine from the context. Is Jesus saying the Father is better than me in essence? Or by virtue of the fact that Jesus is on earth, humbling himself, having humbled himself to be a servant of the Father. He's talking about greater in position and rank, not greater in essence. Let's see. Let, let Scripture interpret Scripture. Just I'm going to use first just the chapter itself. Do me a favor, brother. Go to John 14. And I want you to read 12 to 14 because the word greater appears in 12. Yep, here we go. John 14, 12 to 14. Just read 12 and park it there. We're going to go and unpack it. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my father. There's that word again. Same word, greater. Same chapter, same context. Now, Obviously, Jesus cannot be saying the disciples will be doing better works than him, works that are better, finer in quality, that makes Jesus' works pale in comparison. Yep. That's obviously not the meaning. Neither Even a Muslim wouldn't accept that. Because he just said in that verse, if you guys are paying attention, you got to pay attention. Because it's not sufficient to read the Bible. You have to ask the Spirit to help you read with understanding and then give you the power to live it out, not just to have head knowledge for the sake of head knowledge. And I pray that for myself so I don't become puffed up. Now, notice he says, you'll be doing the works I've been doing. So right there, it's the same works. The works I've been doing, you will be doing when I go to the Father. So it can't be they'll be doing better quality works. So greater here cannot mean qualitatively. Not greater in quality, in nature, and value. It must mean quantitatively, a greater number. You'll be doing the works I've been doing, but a greater number of them. Why? Because Jesus limited himself to <clears throat> Galilee and Jerusalem and its neighboring environs. He didn't go to Rome. He didn't go to Turkey. He didn't go to, you know, didn't go to <clears throat> all the places that the apostles went. So the apostles would go to more places, reach more people, do more miracles of the same kind. But here's where you see the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives the answer why they'll be able to do a greater number of the same miracles he's been doing. He gives the answer. He says, because I'm going to the Father. So if you are a serious student of the Bible, when you read that, you're supposed to ask yourself a question. How is Jesus going to the Father? going to result in the disciples doing a greater number of works. So what's the connection, Jesus? So you're going to go to the Father. When you go to the Father, that will result in them doing a greater number of works than you've been doing, the miracles you've been doing? Yes. What's the connection? You don't need to guess. 13 and 14 tells you. Yep. And whatever you ask in my name that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now you guys got it. If you've been paying attention and learning how to interpret scripture by the power of the Holy Spirit, here's the answer. When I return to the Father, from there, you will ask in my name, and I from the Father's presence will be answering, and I will be doing the works and the miracles for you. So, Peter, how is it you're doing all these miracles? Because Jesus, the risen Lord, from heaven, in union with the Father, together with the Father, and the Spirit indwelling us, He's empowering and enabling us to do those miracles. So my question for this so-called Catholic, what kind of attributes must Jesus possess that from heaven, see, now again, I have to, I have to clarify this because when I used to be more of an anti-Catholic, I would use this to my shame against communion of saints. I want you to understand the difference between communion of saints, asking glorified saints to pray for you, and Jesus answering prayer. And here, William, who knows much more about the Catholic than I do, I'm learning, will confirm what I'm about to say. Communion of saints is the belief that glorified believers are alive, perfected in the presence of the Lord. And by the Spirit, they are made aware of people asking them to pray, but no one believes they answer prayers. That's correct, brother. 
Am I so am I misrepresenting what Catholic Orthodox Assyrian Church? No, you're not at all. And, and they, they take that directly from Revelation 5, where we show that they do definitely intercede. But ultimately, it is the Lamb. It is God that answers all prayer. So that's the difference between communion saints. We ask them, St. Michael, St. Paul, pray for us. They ask the Lord to pray. It is the Lord who answers. So here, yep. Jesus is not simply being asked to tell the Father. Jesus says, when he asks me, I will answer the prayer. Something that everyone, even Muslims agree, is an attribute, a prerogative of God alone. Only God answers prayers. Saints in heaven ask God to pray, right? Angels ask God to pray. But the one who then answers prayers and enables people is the triune God. So Jesus is not simply saying, you'll ask me and I'll ask the Father. No. You ask me, I will do it. So what kind of attributes? He not only is omniscient, omnipresent, but omnipotent. Now, as a Muslim, which he is, does he accept that Jesus in heaven with God the Father and union with God the Father answers all prayers? Of course he does. So that's number one. Yep. The yep. second line of evidence from this chapter that tells me Jesus is not saying God the Father is better than me because I'm a creature and he's the infinite God. But that while I'm on earth in this position, God the Father is greater than me in rank because he dwells in glory and I dwell in humbleness on earth. Go to John 14, 23. Here we go. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Okay, so read, read that again. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. So wait, Jesus says, I, along with the father, will dwell personally. I and the father will truly be present with every true believer. This is a promise only for a true believer. And who's a true believer? The one who seeks to obey the word of the Lord. That means Jesus must know who truly obeys him from those who pay lip service. So he can make a distinction. And secondly, Jesus must have the same ability that the Father has to personally dwell and be present with every single true believer the world over to the same extent and degree that the Father is able to dwell with believers. We will come to him. We will make our home with him. Now, does that sound like Jesus is claiming to be inferior to the Father, a creature, and the Father is infinitely better because the Father is God and Jesus isn't? Or does that just prove that Jesus affirmed essential equality with God, meaning I am equal to the Father in essence and ability? I mean, that's the same chapter, right? I didn't go to another chapter. Same chapter, brother. Now, here's where it's going to be his burial in John 14, verse 6. Same chapter, John 14, verse 6. Here we go. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, Whoa. Jesus just claimed two of the names that even Islam, Islam, his religion, which I don't believe, and I'm appealing to it because now he's a Muslim. Islam attributes specific qualities, characteristics to Allah that you can't give to a creature. One of the names of Allah is Al-Haq. Al-Haq in English is the truth. The truth. And the Quran says Allah is the living. The living. Meaning the one who lives and life comes from him. So I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let me show you where the Quran ascribes these characteristics to God. If you go to chapter 22, brother, brother of the Quran, Surat Al-Hajj, 22, verse 6 to 7. Here we go. Pictal, brother? Yes. Here we go. That is because Allah, he is the truth. Who's the and truth? Because Allah is the truth. But Jesus says, no, I'm the truth. That's correct. And the Quran says, Allah, he is the truth. And because he quickeneth the dead, and because he is able to do all things, and because the hour will come, there is no doubt thereof. And because Allah will raise those who are in the graves. So Allah quickeneth, gives life to the dead because he is life and he's the truth. And the hour will come, which we already 
brought up in the previous part of our response to this guy, where he butchered John 5, 30 and 5, 19 in context, we showed that was the burial service for his God and prophet. Yep. Because Jesus says, at that hour, he, the son of God, will resurrect the dead physically out of their graves by his voice. And yet here it says, Allah does that at that hour. So Jesus claims what the Quran ascribes only, only to true deity, even though all of the Quran is not true deity. And this is all in the same chapter. Who's the truth? According to Quran, Allah. Who gives life to the dead because he is life? According to Quran, Allah. What did Jesus just say in the same chapter of John 14? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you cannot come to the Father apart from me bringing you there. Meaning he's the one who gives you immortal life and existence. Not only that, when Jesus said, you will ask in my name, and I from heaven will hear your prayer. Yep. Let's see what the Quran says. Who in heaven answers prayers on earth according to the Quran? Because remember, if Jesus is just a creature and he's a Muslim, like this stone-licking pagan who claimed to be a Catholic asserts, then Jesus can't be going around saying, I in heaven will answer your prayers, because that would be blasphemy according to Islam. But go to chapter 2, brother, verse 186 of the Quran. Here we go. <clears throat> and when my servants question thee concerning me, then surely I am nigh. I answer the prayer of the suppliant when he crieth unto me. So let them hear my call and let them trust in me in order that they may be led aright. So who are you supposed to call on and who will answer you when you call on him? Allah, I answer prayer, he says. But no, Jesus said he does. I'm confused. Yeah, that's really confusing, brother. Yeah, now go to uh, like uh, chapter 40 of the Quran, read verse 60 and 65. Chapter 40, verse 60 and 65, as I get some water. I'm listening, so you don't have to see my answer face. Here we go. And, and your Lord hath said, pray unto me, and I will hear your prayer. Lo, those who scorn my service, they will enter hell, disgraced. And, and he is the living one. There is He's no the God. The wait, living wait, one. The and living says, one. I am life? That's correct. All right. There is no God save him. So pray unto him, making religion pure for him only. Praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Okay, so we got it. Jesus speaks the way the Quran says, Allah, who's supposedly the true God, speaks and attributes himself abilities that the Quran says can only be ascribed to Allah, not to a creature. And then notice what he said that in that John 14 somehow, somehow shows a distinction from Jesus to uh, and the Father, that Jesus somehow is subject to the Father. But as a Catholic, did he not already know that we don't believe Jesus is the Father? Um I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil the rest of the show. Oh, okay, then I won't. All right. See, I don't even know. Have I watched it, by the way? <laughs> no, no, you have not. Uh, okay. you have not. I want to confirm to the audience, Sam has no idea what is coming in the final right. three minutes. So let me make the final point that we're going to see with the rest of the thing, because your, your reaction tells me that. All right. But the, okay. So now that we explain what it doesn't mean. So I hope you learn what it doesn't mean when Jesus says the father is greater than I. So I just showed you what it doesn't mean. Now, Christians, the Bible is God's voice, the voice of the shepherd to you, his church, if you're part of his church. And it's the sword of the spirit that the spirit expects you to know how to use. If you're not understanding these points, you won't be able to understand how to then live out these truths for the glory of Jesus and then use the word of God in evangelism. So you got to make sure you got to make sure you're listening. So now you understand what it doesn't mean. Now, let's explain what it does mean. Go to John 14, 28. Here we go. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I am going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Now we got to send context. He says, you wouldn't be sad. You wouldn't be heartbroken that I'm physically leaving you for a season. But rather, if you love me, you'd rejoice for me. And then he says, why? Why? Why should we rejoice that you're going to the Father? Why should that make us happy, Jesus? Because all this time he got used to you. Now, again, put yourself in their shoes. Don't just read this as words. This is an actual event that took place in time and space. This is an actual conversation of the historical Jesus who walked this earth in the flesh 
and had disciples who got used to him, who traveled with him, slept next to him, woke up with him, saw him do miracles, who were being loved by him and, and saw how beautiful and loving and holy and majestic he is and amazing. And now he's saying, I'm going to have to leave you. And they're crushed. Yep. You walked into our life and our life has never been the same. You transformed our life and you turned our world upside down. Now you're going to leave us. And so they're heartbroken, right? They're heartbroken. So Jesus is trying to comfort them. Don't be sad. I will physically leave you, but by the spirit, I'm always present with you. And the time will come. You will see me again face to face. So it's only for a short season. You will see me again face to face, but I have to go back. And do you really love me? Yeah, we do. Now, let me put it. So now it's going to sink in. So if you love me, would you rather prefer I remain here where people spit on me, where people cuss me out, where people abuse me, where people threaten me, where people <clears throat> want to kill me, and pretty soon they're going to beat me to a bloody pulp. They're going to whip me to the point of death. They're going to stick a crown of thorns on my head and put spikes in my hands and my feet where I'll be gasping for air because the people on earth do not know who I am. Do you want that for me or do you want you do you want what's best for me? Obviously, we want what's best for you because we love you. We're not that selfish that we'd rather have you in the state of humiliation. Therefore, if you love me, then be happy and rejoice that I'm going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. What he means is, as long as I remain here, the Father will be greater in status. And I'll be in a state of humility, state of humbleness, where sinners can pretty much abuse me. But when I return to the Father, that won't be the case anymore. And the Father will no longer be greater than me because when I return, I will then assume the status of glory that I had with the Father where in heaven people realize I'm the Father's equal and realize I'm worthy of their worship, something that's hidden from them now. So if I remain here, the Father remains greater in status. But if I go, that won't be the case. And people realize that I've always been the Father's equal, worthy of the same worship and honor he receives. Now let me show you that in John 17, verse 5. Mike Hike, stop barking like your bastard dog, Allah. Contact us, give him the Zoom link, and see if I'm reading my presuppositions. I can decimate you and your fake God and prophet, you coward. Stop link is right there. Put the big boy on. Stop on. You, Mike, because I want to make sure you take a hike to the pit of hell where Muhammad is buried on the feet of Jesus, you coward. Or I'm going to block you. You won't have the guts to join, brother. Yeah. You're going to have more guts than you do. Ask the Shia. John 17, verse 5. Here we go. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself. With a glory which I had with you before the world was. Okay, so wait. Glorify me alongside of yourself with the glory I had with you before the world was. So if Jesus remains on earth, uh, brother, will he have that glory, the glory that he shares side by side with the Father in heaven? He will not. So that's why he says, do you really love me? Of course we love you, Lord Jesus. You are our love, our life. Though we fail you in... We don't want to. We want to honor you because you are our heart's desire. Then would you rather have me here in this state of humblest humility, traveling from place to place, having no place to call my own, where people abuse me? Or do you want me to return to that glory by which I sit alongside the Father? And when the inhabitants of heaven see the Father and I, they see two eternally divine equal persons, the Father and the Son. Amen, That's brother. And, and I wonder, can can this Muslim, the open-minded Muslim, can he affirm that this glory, that this glory was had before the world was? He I don't cannot, know any Muslim that can do that. He cannot affirm that God is truly Jesus's father from before the creation of the world. He cannot affirm that Jesus is truly the son of God in an unique way who already existed with the father personally side by side before the world was created and he cannot affirm that the son already existed before the creation of the world in the same glory with the father and he cannot affirm that now he's basking in the same glory side by side with the father on the father's throne he cannot affirm any of that now as a catholic he's, he was supposed to 
or he should have at least known that. But there are no Indian, there's not a single indication that this open minded Muslim knows anything about the Christian faith, yep, not is. even elementary things. Yeah, so don't, don't believe it, guys. He was never a Catholic man, never. No. Come on, man. And by the way, <clears throat> just to let you know, because he went to seminary, I don't expect Catholics to know their faith unless they're deliberately intentional about learning. Because I met a lot of Christians of all variety of branches have no clue what they're supposed to believe. In fact, by by way, uh, look at this clown. A hey, clown. Don't write him down. Call now so I can muzzle you like Jesus muzzled your fake God. Look at this dude. Don't run. Tell Mike, don't run, you little coward. Still running his mouth? Yeah, that little punk says, I'll write him down. No, come now. Don't write him down. You don't need to write anything. All right, just well, let me muzzle this guy. Well, well he's got to know that you're wrong if he's saying they're all presuppositions. Yeah. Why would you need to write it down if you know I'm already wrong, you little satanic tool? But coming back to the issue, on Facebook, I asked a, a sister because she had a Muslim last name. I said, are you a Muslim? She goes, no. I go, so are you a Christian? Look what she, look at her response. Now, she's not catechized. She doesn't know. And I'm using this as illustration. Yeah. Guys, I'm using this as illustration. I said, are you Christian? She goes, no, I'm Catholic. Get it? I said, are you Christian? No, I'm Catholic. I go, last time I checked, Catholics are Christians. <sighs> I want to get over. Poorly Catholics catechized. Catholics are Christians. Yep. But see... Because she's so badly catechized, she doesn't know her faith. And sadly, her mother, Catholic, was, was married to a Muslim. Yeah, there That's you why go, right there. That's her Muslim last name, Rahim. Her Muslim last name is Rahim. So her father's Muslim. That means a Catholic woman married a Muslim. And you know, I don't know if you guys know this. You should know this. That is condemned in the Bible. And yep. there is no Catholic church that I'm aware of that's solid. That would actually, maybe you can correct me. Maybe you have a liberal bishop, but I'm talking about solid, yeah. conservative, Bible-believing Catholics who love the church that would honor such a marry, marriage where a Catholic woman marries a Muslim and that they would perform a sacramental marriage. Am I mistaken? No, you know? you, you, you're correct, brother. In fact, uh, that, is, uh, that is something they would, a good priest and a good bishop would counsel against it. Of course, we know we're living in a time when there are so many poor liberal bishops and priests, but you've got to go through classes before getting married in, in the usual way you do it in the Catholic Church. And if they know that that's the situation, well, they're right away going to say, OK, the children are not going to be raised within the Catholic faith. If that is what is affirmed, they're not going to it, it is not going to go through. Unfortunately, we're living in times where that is not followed to its conclusion as it should be. And there's a problem we have, brother. So many people horribly catechized. I mean, it's just, it's really a disappointment. So I'll give her a, a pass. She's not catechized. This guy went to seminary. Yeah. God, call in now, Mike. Mike, you're violating the law of identity because you're a filthy, satanic dog who thinks you're human. Stop waxing eloquent. You're a dumb, stupid idiot. The guy's trying to sound intelligent. Dude. I'm not your average Christian. I will humiliate you. Call me now. Stop barking because we just removed you in the channel. But now again, let me come back to the issue so you guys follow. I don't blame her. She's not catechized. But this guy went to seminary, so I will hold him accountable. Now shock me, brother. We've answered John 14, 28. Shock me. Okay, there's, there's one more, and then it gets to the uh, the laughter. So here we, uh, here we go. I'm not Don. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Our Father who art in heaven, he didn't pray. Our Father who art is standing right here. Hmm. What did he say? Let me, let me rewind that. What did he say? I, I hope you understand what was it. Let me rewind that for you. Pay attention. Now, that I'm not done, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Our Father who art in heaven, he didn't pray. Our Father who art is standing right here. Oh, hmm. uh, okay, that's why it's striking off. You want me to demolish that one? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, notice this guy who claims to be a Catholic just collapsed the identity of the Father and the Son. In other words, he's basically stating, and I want you to understand the assumption. If Jesus was God, that means he's the Father. But notice he's not the Father. The Father's in heaven. But if Jesus was God, he would say, Our Father standing right here, meaning. For Jesus to be God, Jesus must be the Father. Which Catholic seminarian does not know 
Jesus is not the Father, but Jesus is the eternal Son of the Father, who's one with him in essence. So that to say, our Father who art in heaven, somehow means Jesus is in God, that would never come out of the mouth of a true Catholic seminarian, who if he went to seminary, would at least have a basic idea of the Trinity. You're right? 100%, so you're 100% correct. Now, that's number one. Now, number two, let me show you how this backfires against him. The Father was there on earth, not because he's Jesus. See, again, here's, here's the idiocy. He assumes that God is a spatially bound being, meaning that God, like creation, like creatures, is bound to time, space, and place. So that God has a body of some kind that binds him to a location. If anyone knows the true, the true understanding of their theology, Catholic, Orthodox, we all agree on this when it comes to Trinity. We believe God created time, space, and place. That means by the very nature of God, God is faceless. God is placeless. God is timeless because he doesn't have a body of any kind, of any substance that limits him to a location. He's so majestic that when he created time, space, and place, he can then appear in any place throughout creation, in any form, and he can appear in multiple forms at the same time, but he's bound by none of it. So it is true that the Father in heaven now does appear visibly. He appears visibly so that you can see God the Father visibly. And we know this from Daniel 7. We're not going to turn there, but let me give you the verses. Daniel 7, verses 9 to 10, and then read Daniel 7, 13 to 14. And Revelation 4 and 5, where both Daniel and John saw God the Father visibly with a visible body, a visible shape, on a visible throne, and saw Jesus distinct from him. And for you Catholics, you see this depicted. When I was a kid, I used yep. to go to Catholic church when I was very young. I didn't know much about the faith. So I would go there, and I remember seeing, I guess it was on the ceiling, to the right of me, what looked like an older, elderly person. Yep. To my, the left of me, to his right, a younger person, that was Jesus. And in between, a dove and a cross behind them. You guys know what I'm talking about, that image. Okay. Now, I didn't know where this image came from. And then years later, I then realized that this image is thoroughly biblical. That image of God the Father appearing as an elderly person where he has white hair and a white robe, that comes straight out of Daniel 7, 9 to 10. And the reason why Jesus looks like a young man is because Jesus, who became in flesh, incarnate, he became a true human being, took flesh from the blessed womb of his blessed virgin mother. He died in his 30s, so he would be young. And why the dove? Because the Holy Spirit appeared as a dove. So this image is thoroughly biblical. And what's my point? Right there as Catholics, you see that it's not against your Catholic faith to believe that God the Father appears visibly in heaven. He's invisible to us here on earth, but he's visible to the inhabitants of heaven. And then according to Revelation, God the Father himself will come down and join the Son on earth where we will see him visibly forever in a perfected world. New heaven, new earth. That's Revelation 21 and 22. Okay, what's the point? God is faceless. There isn't a location that God is not present overseeing and sustaining. Because if God isn't omnipresent, that means he's not overseeing every part of creation. That means he's not sustaining all creation. Then if he's not sustaining it, it can't exist. You understand? Basic theology. This is not advanced theology, guys. I'm not giving you deep stuff. No, this is very basic. What you're supposed to learn as you grow in your faith. There can't be a part of creation that God is not personally sustaining preserving, controlling, and overseeing, because if he's not sustaining it, it can't exist. So when we say our Father in heaven, that doesn't mean God the Father is not present on earth. He's present invisibly. We don't see him. But he is present in heaven visibly, where angels and the glorified saints see him visibly, That like John saw him and Daniel saw him. That's number one. Number two, because God the Father, like the Son and the Spirit, is not spatially bound, Jesus himself says that same Father in heaven is here with me, and the Spirit is with me, and though I'm on earth, I'm still with him in heaven. Go to John 3.13. John 3.13, and read that for them. 
Amen. Brother. Hope you guys Amen. understood my point. Here we go. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. And by the way, our most ancient manuscripts, most accurate manuscripts, and many church fathers have that last clause, last clause, which is in heaven. Because there are some early copies that omit it. However, the majority of Greek witnesses and many church fathers, when they quote John 3.13, their version had the Son of Man who is in heaven. So notice Jesus saying, I, the Son of Man, came down to the earth, but I'm still in heaven. In fact, to confirm that even the Latin Vulgate reads that way, brother, go to the Dewey Rames and see. Yep, here we go. Here we go. And no man hath ascended into heaven, but he that descended from heaven, the son of man who is in heaven. Now, my brother here, may the Lord Jesus perfect him for his glory and preserve him and bless our union to be inseparable until the Lord calls us home. He will tell you if I'm wrong. Is it not true that the official version of the Catholic Church is Latin Vulgate? That's correct, brother. Yep. Yep. So this reading is there. Can a Catholic, if he's faithful to the church, reject that reading? Nope. You are correct, brother. That, and not only that, uh, from what I remember, the massive majority of fathers do quote it in yes. that manner. Yes. Now, what's sad is your New American Bible Revised Edition, because, and this is what's ironic, and this is something everyone needs to know. My Protestant brothers whom I love, many Catholics don't know this, Orthodox don't know this, the rise of liberal, critical, biblical scholarship started from Protestants. Yep. It is one of the fruits of Protestantism. This is a fact. In the 18th century, a group of German Protestants, because they were anti-supernatural, <clears throat> materialist, atheists, or agnostics, who didn't really believe God exists, and if he did, he inspired the author of Scripture. And many of them were Masons and being, being used of the devil to infiltrate the church. They started destroying destroying the historicity and authenticity of the Bible. And that scholarship seeped into Catholic institutions. It started from Protestantism. Even the science of modern textual criticism has influenced and impact modern Catholic scholars because your Bible, New American Bible, Revised Edition, is based on the critical Greek editions produced by Protestants who prioritize the earlier Greek copies, which means that these Catholics are not really honoring and being faithful to the set of Greek manuscripts that Jerome used to translate the Latin, uh, translate into Latin, manuscripts that had these readings, which now modern Catholic versions omit because of the fruit of Protestant textual criticism. And, and to, be, to be quite fair, brother, to add to that, that liberal fruit would go on to infect Catholic seminaries. As you know, yes. uh, the heresies from uh, Raymond Brown, the heresies from Joseph Fitzmaier, who those individuals did, did a lot of damage and tore down a lot of people's faiths. By the way, listen tonight. You, uh, funny you mentioned Raymond Brown. I'm going to refute Shabir Ali's referencing Raymond Brown in yesterday's debate. Raymond Brown, was, a, was he a priest? He was a priest, that's correct. He died in the 90s. He was considered one of the foremost New Testament scholars, flaming liberal, believed the Bible was full of errors, that there were contradictions. Some of these books were forgeries, were not written by the people that the letter says was written by and, and made up a lot of stories about Jesus and that Moses didn't write the Pentateuch. And yet he was a Catholic priest who taught in, I believe, Union Theological Seminary who Muslims love and have been quoting for years. He's one of Shabir Ali's favorites. Yesterday, Shabir Ali in his debate with Matt Slick mentioned him again and sadly misquoted him. So tonight, Lord willing, you got about 400. Guys, yeah. show up tonight with that same number because I'm going to decimate Shabir Ali and prove he's an apostate if the Lord Jesus wills. It's already scheduled on my YouTube channel. I'll give you the link. And so it's ironic you mentioned Raymond Brown, who's supposedly a Catholic because Shabir Ali quotes him. All the time. So keep yep. that in mind. John 3.13, the most accurate <clears throat> copies of John 3.13. And a plethora of church fathers, when they quoted John 3.13, has our Lord's words 
No one has ascended to heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man, who is in heaven. So Jesus is telling you, physically, I'm on earth, but because he's God, he's still in heaven. He's in heaven and earth. Now go to John 10, 37 to 38. Where is the Father? John 10, 37 to 30, 38. Oh, let me go back to the New King James. Yep. Here we go. 37, 38. Here we go. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. So note, we're not saying Jesus is the Father. That's modalism. That's a heresy. But because the Father is not spatially bound, he's not bound to time, space, and place. And because he's inseparable from the Son and they're inseparable from the Spirit, they cannot work independently and separately. They're always working together. So where the Son is, the Father and the Spirit are. Where the Spirit is, the Father and the Son are. Because as one God, who do not occupy time, space, and place, we're not bound because they don't have a material body like we do, where we're limited by it. They are present everywhere. So the same Jesus who said the Father's in heaven, he says he's right here with me. He's in me, yep. with me, working through me, and I'm working with him. Now go to John 14, 7. All the way to 11. Here we go. Here we go. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Keep reading all the way to 11. Oh, my bad, brother. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Now, if modalism was true, here is the perfect time for Jesus. Says, I am the Father, and the Father yeah. is me. I mm -hmm. know. The Father's in me, and I'm in the Father. Like, Jesus is in me, and I'm in Jesus. So I'm not Jesus because he's in me. And so Jesus is not the Father, but the Father is in him. And he's saying, look, the Father is in me, not the Father is me. I'm in the Father, not that I am the Father. And the Father is with me, doing the works together with me. So when I'm doing the miracles, I'm not doing it alone. My Father and I are doing it together. And then I'm going to show you the Holy Spirit as well. Because yep. the triune God always, immutably, work together inseparably. They never work independently. And because they're not spatial, a spatial being with, with bodies of some sort, they, they cannot be separated spatially so that the sun is over there. The, they're one in their essence, and therefore they're always together. But they can appear, they can appear spatially <clears throat> distinct from one another so that the Father can appear in a visible shape. And then Jesus can appear in his glorified physical body next to him and the Holy Spirit next to them in any shape he chooses. But by nature, they don't have bodies by which they are spatially separated. Like, I'm separated from William. He has his own space. He occupies his own place. He has his own body separate from me because we're creatures. Same with angels. Angels don't have bodies made of the dust of the earth, but they are created with some type of shape by which you can see them. And in that shape, they can shift their shape, change their form. Nonetheless, they're still bound to time, space, and place. The only being who, who isn't is God. So where Jesus is, the Father has to be there because they're one in essence. They can't be separated, though they're not the same person. It is something beyond our ability to comprehend, but it is scripture. So here, the same Jesus, the Father's in heaven. He's here with me right now, in me. We're working together. And the same Jesus is on earth, says I'm in heaven. Because let me ask you a question. If Jesus is on earth and the Father is in Jesus, that means the Father is on earth, right? Guys, I want you to answer so make sure you're I'm not confusing you. That's why I repeat myself more than once. If Jesus is on earth and Jesus says the Father is in me, that means the Father is on earth, right? And let me know if the Zoom are responding because I'm waiting because there's like a 20. Yeah, let's see what, what uh, let me see. Zoom, uh, 
Rob says yes in Zoom. Okay. Well, then let me ask you a follow-up question. If the Father is in heaven, visibly on a throne, and Jesus says he's in the Father, that means Jesus is still in heaven. If the Father is in Jesus and Jesus is on earth, then the Father is on earth. But if Jesus is in the Father and the Father is in heaven, that means Jesus is in heaven. It's reciprocal. If the Father is in heaven, Jesus is there. Now, what's the difference? Jesus isn't in heaven visibly. Yep. The one thing that's not true in heaven at this time is that though he appeared visibly in heaven, when he came down to earth to become flesh from the Blessed Virgin and a human being, his visible presence was no longer seen. Though he was still there with the Father, the Father was seen. Just like Jesus is visibly on earth in his physical body because he's truly human, one person took on a human nature. And the Father was there with him on earth, but not visibly. You didn't see the Father visibly, but he did appear visibly in heaven. There's only one time that we are made aware of. Maybe there are other times that there's only one time where the Father appeared visibly on earth. That was on the Mount of Transfiguration when the cloud came down visibly. Show them, brother, Mark 9, 7. Yep. Here we go. That's the only time. That, that we know. Maybe there are other times, but this is the only time that we know the Father manifested his presence visibly where they saw an actual cloud appear visibly and come upon them, and they heard the Father's voice audibly. Yep. Here we go. And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. Now to prove to you, the apostles saw the cloud, like they saw Moses and Elijah earlier in the same chapter, and saw Jesus transfigure, becoming dazzling white, signifying his deity and absolute purity. Let's see what Peter said about this encounter. Did Peter see God the Father? When I say see, saw the cloud, which meant the Father come down and hear him audibly? 2 Peter 1, 16 to 18. And guys, let me just encourage you. The stuff you're getting from William, and I'm not tickling his ears, that you're getting from my channel, others that we work with, is stuff you won't even get in seminary. Yep. I'm not lying to you. You're not going to get this stuff in seminary. That's correct, and I'm brother. Never, thank the Lord. Thank Jesus. I never went to Bible college or seminary. Thank you, Lord. Because I would have entered the lie, but it came out dead. 2 Peter 1, 16 to 18. Here we go. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And when he heard this voice, which came we, from heaven. Yep. Yep. Not, and we heard his we voice. We heard this voice, which came from heaven, when we were with him on the holy mountain. We so, heard. So you saw that here God the Father appeared visibly because the cloud signified God the Father is present visibly. And then spoke audibly where the apostles heard it. But for the most part, the father remained invisible, though he was on earth, and he's still on earth, overseeing creation, preserving creation, and he's working with the son. Just like the son was still in heaven with the father, where the father appeared visibly in his visible glory on a throne where the angels saw, though in heaven, he wasn't manifesting his presence visibly to the angels. So the son was still with the father, but he was invisible. And the father was with the son on earth, though the father was invisible. You see how it's working here? Yep. Now, was the Holy Spirit there? Well, everyone should know that. Go to John 1, 32 to 33. So all three persons of the Godhead were on earth, working in perfect union, using Jesus's physical body to carry out God's will on earth. So was the Holy Spirit here? Yep. John 1, 32, 33. Here we go. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he remained upon him i did not know him but he who was sent me to baptize with water said to me upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining on him this is he who baptizes with the holy spirit so did everyone get basic theology 101 
When Jesus is on honor physically, the Father was with him and the Spirit was with him. All three persons were on earth. Father was invisible, appeared one time visibly. The Holy Spirit appeared one time visibly as a miraculous confirmation to John. He is the one that God has sent, the Son, God in the flesh, whom I work with. But after that moment, no one saw the Holy Spirit visibly. So the Father and Son and Spirit were all together working perfectly and separately while on earth. But only the Son was seen visibly because he had now become flesh, a true human, taking flesh from the blessed womb of the Blessed Virgin Mother. Now go to John 14, 16 and 17. Here we go. Watch here. Now, guys, I have to belabor these points because I'm more concerned with you than this guy, unless the Lord grants some repentance. So you don't ever fall prey for these pathetic arguments and you can decimate them for the glory of Jesus. Amen. And I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Notice, the spirit is invisible unless he wants to appear visibly, which is why the world cannot see him. But now he's thought about the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, because in John 14, 26, that spirit of truth is the Holy Spirit. But guys, if you didn't catch it, look what he said. Unlike the world who doesn't know the spirit, nor can see the spirit because he's invisible, you know him. Peter, you know him. John, you know him. Why? Because he's already with you. And the time will come, he will then be in you. Yep. What do you mean he's with us, Lord? Where is he? He's right here working in me and through me. But the same chapter said the Father's also there. The same chapter, right? I think he froze. Did you guys freeze or something? Did you guys get hear me? I think I'm all right, but uh, William, I think William froze. Hold on. Hold on, let's see. Alrighty, you guys okay? Uh, so it's William. Oh, William, you okay? Uh, I'm, I'm there. Are you able to hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was there I frozen? Or you froze? No, that that was me, brother. It was on my end. Okay, good. Because I because I know I have internet problems. Like I got scared. I go, did my internet go out again? I, I, right. I think I think you transferred that to me. <laughs> oh yes, remember it's uh, worse than COVID and vitanitis. It's oh uh, yeah. <laughs> but now, did you catch it? That's the same chapter. In John 14, 7 to 11, where Jesus says, the Father's in me, and I in the Father, and the Father is doing his works through me. And that same chapter says, the Spirit is also with you, because he's with me, he's in me, working through me. So do you understand? This is what's called the parachoresis, the mutual indwelling of the Trinity. All three divine persons were working perfectly, using the physical body, human nature, the flesh of Jesus, while Jesus is on earth. Did that sink in now? Before I now... To show, because someone asked me, well, what about hell? Is God in hell? Well, I'm going to show you from scripture in a minute. But I just want to make sure, did everyone get this? On Zoom, you're going to get the feedback. I'm waiting for them on YouTube to let me know. You guys got it now? So our Father in heaven, but he's also on earth with, uh, with me. The Father is in me doing his works, but I'm in the Father. So the Son on earth is also in heaven. Everyone got it? Zoomers? Did they, what's their feedback? What are they telling you? When? I think William's frozen. Okay. William's got some technical problems. That's okay. All right. Revelation 14. If yeah, I'm going to have to read the verses until he gets back. Revelation 14. Yep. Zoom got it. Okay, good, good. You, there's a delay on your part. Not, how, yeah, it's on my part. I, it's my, my internet. I don't know why it's unstable. Okay, yeah. Good. All right. Now, to answer the question, the answer to the question, does that mean because God is not spatially bound and limited because he doesn't have a body that binds him time, space, and place, and since he created everything, even hell, and hell is part of creation, and he sustains and preserves everything, even hell, and so the entire creation is present before him, does that mean he's also present in hell in some sense? Yes. Revelation 14, verse 10 tells you that. But go to Revelation 14, read verses 9 to 11. Revelation 14, verse 10, but we're going to read verses 9 to 11. Here we go. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Whose presence is in hell overseeing the torment? The holy angels, the presence of the Lamb. 
So the Lamb Jesus is also there? That's correct. Read 10 again and then all the way to 11. Read 10. And yep. He himself down. shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. Mm. Now read 11. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. So we got that canard out of the way. What else does he got to say? Here we go. Try to hold, uh, hold your laughter back. Father, who art in heaven, parta nostra quia sin chalice. The book of Matthew, chapter 29, verse 46. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Pause, brother. There is no Matthew 29, 46. He meant to say Matthew 27, 46. So he's an ignoramus who can't even get his references correct. Yeah, our, our brother, I think he's having... Okay, you back? Inconceivable. <laughs> okay. So you yeah, caught it? Said Matthew, I heard it. Yep. Matthew 29, 46. He meant to say Matthew 27, 46. But let, what's his point there? Go ahead. It's uh, inconceivable if he's got the credit. It's not possible. Now, finally, Williams... He, uh, that's all he says in that point. He says that it, it, it's impossible that he could not have cried out to, uh, to God the Father if he was, uh, if he was truly God. Okay. Let me put holes in that real quickly. Uh, okay, again, we've established Jesus is not the Father. If he was truly a Catholic, he would have known that. But then someone said, well, why is he referring to, G to God, to the Father, as my God? Isn't he God? So why say to the Father, my God, when Jesus is God? Well, if he's a Catholic, like he claims to be, he believes in the hypostatic union. That the eternal Logos, the eternal Son, became in flesh, the God-man. And by the way, you need to not articulate your belief. Yep. We don't believe Christ is two persons, a human person, divine person. That's the Nestorian heresy that some people falsely accuse me of, which I don't believe, never believed, and I still don't believe it. Anyway, he's one eternal divine person, an uncreated person, who took a human nature and all that it entails, a physical body from the blessed, holy, consecrated womb of the Blessed Virgin Mother, and I can't emphasize that enough, that she's blessed and she's holy and she's the virgin, the virgin mother of our Lord. And when he took that human nature to himself and that physical body, he's still one divine person who becomes a human being. He didn't become a human person. So when he becomes flesh, as he enters creation to become human, to become flesh, from that moment on, the father becomes his God. So before he became flesh, having just one nature, a divine nature, he had no God over him. Okay, he had no God over him. He only had one nature, divine nature. And as the son, he only had God as his father. It's when he became flesh that the father became his God. Now, let me prove that to you. Go to Jeremiah 32, 27. And this, this psalm will prove it as well. Yep. Jeremiah 32, 27. Yahweh, Jehovah is the God of all flesh. Here we go. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Now, notice, notice it's basar in Hebrew, flesh. Jehovah is the God of all flesh. But wait, last time I checked in John 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. But then 14 says, The Word became flesh and pitched his tent, tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, guys, help me understand rationally. If the Word, who's not the Father, becomes flesh to become the Father's servant, should it then shock us and surprise us that once he becomes flesh, the Father would become his God? Should that shock you, surprise you, or should that be expected? Should be expected. There you go. Now, make sure they got it in your yep. Zoom. I want to make sure they get it. Yep. Because Zoomers. the stuff that the Lord quotes will prove it as well. Oh, yeah. That's the... And these these are this is elementary theology, brother. Yeah. I mean, really, really, this is beginner level. I mean, Zoom Zoom got it, by the way, brother. Zoom is getting okay. they're they're right on target tonight. Good. Now let's see the words that Jesus uttered because he's uttering the words of Psalm twenty two, a psalm that shows his vindication that when Jesus cried those words, 
the father would come to deliver him. That's why right after that, he says, father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. So go to Matthew 27, 46. He said 29. It's Matthew 27, 46. The ignoramus can't even double check his sources before he embarrasses himself live. That is what he is, brother. He's an ignoramus. Here yeah, we get go. Jason born out of here. The dude is a stalker. He's a stone licking pagan jihadi spiritual prostitute of the devil like his prophet who never debates he just comes and rants like the dog like his prophet get the guy out of here guys don't tolerate him okay so now many of those brother that come they run their mouth but they're too cowardly to show up and debate too many of those matthew 27 46 the words of our lord here we go and about the ninth hour jesus cried out with a loud voice saying eli eli lama sabachthani that is my god my god why have you forsaken me? Now let's see what psalm our Lord was uttering and how this buries him. Go to Psalm 22. Verse 1 is what our Lord was uttering. And it's not a psalm of abandonment. It's a psalm of, when will you come to deliver me from my situation? In other words, it's basically Jesus saying, Father, the price has been paid. How much longer will I remain in this condition? In other words, it's over with. It's paid. Time for me to come home to you. And that's why the darkness was removed. And Jesus says, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And it was over. It's because the psalm signifies the deliverance of the psalmist. That when the psalmist says these words, he'd be delivered from his predicament because the price had been paid in full. Where am I getting this from? Let's see the psalm that he's quoting from. Psalm 22, verse 1. Here we go. My God, my God, why has he forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? So this is the psalm our Lord quotes. Now read verse 16 to see that this is a psalm prophesying the crucifixion of our Lord. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. So did they what to my hands and my feet? They pierced my hands and my feet. So then why did Jesus utter these words of the psalmist? Because now read, why did he utter these words? Because now read Psalm 22, verses 23 to 24. It says, after his predicament, after being nailed, after being mocked, after being killed and, you know, buried in the dust of, of, of death, God hears him and delivers him. And then the psalmist says, rejoice with me because God heard me when I said these words and delivered me. Exactly what happened to Jesus on the cross. Amen. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All you offspring of Israel, for he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. You see why he quoted the psalm, guys? He didn't quote the psalm because he felt abandoned. He quoted the psalm because he knew he had fulfilled... <clears throat> The debt of sin. He had paid it fully. He had accomplished redemption. So the Psalms signify that when the psalmist cries out those words, that's when he'd be delivered from his predicament. His spirit will leave his body. Body returned to the dust. And on the third day, he'd be raised immortal. So it's not a cry of abandonment. It's a cry, mission accomplished. I've been pierced. I've been beaten. They've mocked me. It's all in that Psalm. They cast lots for my, my garments. Mission accomplished. I've done it. So now don't be far from my cries. Deliver me. And that's where, if you pay attention, that's where the darkness, after he prayed the prayer, the darkness was removed. And then Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The spirit left his body. <laughs> accomplished. Now, how does this prove the point? Cool, Muso. Thank the Lord for him. He's learning these arguments because he's mastering them, using them. Amen. How does this prove the point that the Father only became Jesus' God? Listen to me. The Father only became Jesus' God when Jesus became human. And this passage destroys abortion, shows it's, it's murder. Ironically, the same psalm that Jesus quoted, look what it says in Psalm 22, verse 10. Here we go. I was cast upon you from birth, from my, mother, from my mother's womb. You have been my God. So not before my mother's womb. No, let me read that again, brother, so it can sink in for them. I was cast upon you from birth, from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Is it coincidence that he says, from my, my conception, 
in the womb of the Blessed Virgin, that's when you've been my God? Because before that, he had no God over him. And notice this proves that human life begins in the womb at conception because you've been my God from my mother's womb from when she conceived me in her womb. Yep. All right. Well, I mean, that was it. He's done. Unless you have someone else that's going to floor me even more. Get ready to get floored. Oh, really? <laughs> he. I want to emphasize to the audience, he is not just bad. He's abysmal. Uh, I didn't think it, could, it was possible to be worse than Zachary Naik, but this man is a fraud. Of course. Read the book of John, chapter 17, verse 21 to 23, that all of them might be one. Father, just as you and I in me and I in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. In this prayer, Jesus defines the term to be one, it's clearly accomplished through the relationship of two autonomous beings. Christian believers are to model their, you know, relationship to become one after the relationship of God and Jesus Christ, as God and Christ are one. Notice that to be one does not mean to be one and the same. So that idea that Jesus himself is God the Father coming in the form of Jesus Christ is not true. The book hear of that? the Bible has proven beyond. You hear that? Yeah, replay that for them. Notice? I, I want them to hear this. Listen, guys, this is a guy who was a Catholic, went to seminary. To be one does not mean to be one and the same. So that idea that Jesus himself is God the Father coming in the form of Jesus Christ is not true. Jesus himself is God the Father coming in the form of Jesus Christ is not true. The book of the Bible has proven beyond reasonable doubt that Jesus Christ is an autonomous being from, you know, God in heaven. So that brother, I'm just wondering, uh, what 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 seminary did he go to? Yeah, guys, notice uh, how demonically nasty, repulsive, and I'm not trying to be personal, but you can't help it. Nope. Notice his voice, how just wickedly, yep. demonically it sounds. And Lotus is just his composure. Look at and even the lighting. Look, it's dark yep. because he subconsciously, he subconsciously revealing the darkness that's consumed him. The face it looks like a demon. He speaks like he's an effeminate sodomite. And I'm sorry, guys, I'm not politically correct. And the tone, the way he speaks, it's like a demon possessing him. May the Lord Jesus give him what he deserves or grant him repentance. Because as yeah. long as there's breath in our lungs and Jesus is pleased with us and fills us with the spirit to be holy and love the Lord and forgives us when we fail, we will destroy the liars and their blasphemies and muzzle them for the glory of the Lord. But you heard it from his own mouth. This guy could not be a Catholic. Because if he's just a lay Catholic, like that sister who said, when I said, are you a Christian? She goes, no, I'm Catholic. Well, she's not trained. Okay, I understand. But this guy went to seminary. How the hell do you get to seminary without going to college first, right? You can't just jump in seminary. You got to go to Catholic college, right? How, how does that, that's how it works? You sure do, brother. And, 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 and let me, I, I want to emphasize for people so they can really grasp this because for he, he didn't only claim that he went to seminary this gentleman claimed that he was well into seminary when he began to stump priests and bishops and they didn't know how to answer him. So they kicked him out. And I want to emphasize for people here, I told you you were going to laugh. I want to emphasize this open-minded Muslim. He comes and does videos trying to refute me and Sam. This is why in a million years, he would never show up to debate me or Sam. I'm going to play it one more time for the audience and for his shame, because we're going to get a clip out of this. You are going to be put forth as the fraud that you are. Jesus himself is God the Father coming in the form of Jesus Christ is not true. The book of the Bible. He is arguing that Christ, that we, be that we believe that Christ is the Father incarnate, that he is the Father in the flesh. Brother, uh, I mean... <laughs> he, stumps, uh, he stumped them at seminary. Oh, now here's what's on the passage, and I'm going to now use the passage to destroy 
is blasphemy. Show that Muhammad is truly, truly a satanic dog. Amen. Come under the feet of Jesus, burning in hell, and of the Quran is Satan, Muhammad's father and this man's father. We're going to bury your prophet because of your blasphemy against Jesus. As surely as the Lord lives, who, who is our life and who holds our lives in his possession, he's almighty. We will now punish your prophet even more than I've already been doing because of your blasphemy against Jesus, your God, and Muhammad's destroyer. Now, you saw the fraud. No Trinitarian believes God the Father became flesh. God the Father is Jesus. That's number one. But number two, ironically, even in that passage, it shows that Jesus must be God. Because look what the pagan stone licker didn't pay attention to. Read John 17 for us, brother. Yep. He went 21 to 23. Read John 17, 20 to 23 for us. Slowly, because notice how the very passage proves the deity of Christ. Here we go. I'm going to go slowly. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you and me. Right there. They, I in all of them and I in you. So I want this pagan stone licker who follows a pedophile, woman raping false prophet Muhammad, and I can document all of that if he's man enough to debate me. I'll yep. use his own sources to prove Muhammad raped women, even married women, lusted for his daughter-in-law, destroyed adoption, and mounted a minor in the name of Allah, his satanic God. I'll prove it. I'm, I have the proof from the Quran and Sunnah. I want him to show me anywhere in the Old Testament, even in his toilet paper called the Quran, no one's disrespect to toilet paper, where a prophet, a creature, an angelic creature says, I indwell all believers. Did you guys catch it? Jesus says, I am in all of them. It's because Jesus is personally in union in fellowship and communion with all believers. It's his union with us that connects us to God, making us children of God the Father. How in the world can Jesus be in personal, intimate communion and union with all believers simultaneously if Jesus is not omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent? Now finish it to 23. Here we go. I'm going to read 23 from the beginning again, brother. I am them and you and me that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. So what better way to end the burial service of this clown by showing you what Jesus said? Guys, I want you, and I pray the Holy Spirit will remind you of these words and will penetrate your heart to fall more in love with Jesus and that the Holy Spirit will empower me to resist sin and walk in holiness and not be a hypocrite. And I pray that for all of us. Did you see what our Lord said? Because of my... Being in union with my body, the church, the spiritual body of Christ, the members of his body. I'm in all of them. I connect with all of them. I'm in fellowship with them, communion with them, preserving them, sealing them, loving them. Because of that union, my father loves every one of you just as much as he loves me. Did you catch it? I want the world to know not only the father sent me, but that the father loves those who are in me and I in them, connected to them, preserving them, my spiritual body. He loves them just as he loves me. Meaning that if Jesus lives in you, the Holy Spirit lives in you, you are sons and daughters of the living God, and God the Father loves and adores you as much as he loves and adores Jesus because of Jesus' grace. How can you not be in love with Jesus and the God revealed in Scripture, right? Amen. Now, with that said, guys, don't put the guy in timeout. Block him, man. You keep putting him in timeout. The guy barks like his prophet. Block him. Now, with that said. We got another troll, brother? Yeah, the, he's a troll, I think, Jason Bourne, the, the satanic dog. They keep putting him in timeout. Get rid of the dude. Yep. But anyway, guys, unless there's more that we need That's to cover. That's it, brother. That's it. That's it. Well, I'm sharing the link with you guys. You had a good crowd, brother. You have about 440. Amen, brother. They love Name it when we're together, brother. The Son of God Almighty, by His Spirit, prosper you, preserve you and your family, and wash you. And I pray that He pur purifies me of my filth. Walk in holiness, worthy of the Lord. May He increase your numbers for His glory. 
Bless your ministry in Jesus' name. Now, guys, don't forget tonight, I'm exposing Shibra Ali. Not only is he a liar, he's an apostate. His words officially <clears throat> bring him out of Islam. What I'm going to show you tonight, here's the link. I just posted it. It's on my channel. I've scheduled it for tonight. It should be, let's see, 11 p.m., 12 p.m. I know it's going to be late for the people in New York, Michigan. It's going to be 2 a.m., yeah, 2 a.m., Michigan time, New York time, Eastern Standard time. But for England, it will be around 7, 8 in the morning. In Europe, Australia, it's going to be afternoon early enough for you. Announce it on your social media pages. Show up. I already got it scheduled. I put the link in YouTube. Let me give it to you guys here. Pray for me that I'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. Pray for me that the Lord Jesus will cleanse me and purify me of my sin and my filth to overcome my flesh and walk in holiness. Pray the Lord helps me to stay healthy, that he blesses my daughters and loves them and preserves them and brings them to me. There it is. Schedule. Pray for that. Make it go viral. We had about 440 tonight. Let's see that number later tonight for the glory of Jesus. Amen. So I look and forward brother, to brother, I got to say this. The more and more you do these videos, even Muslims are going to start rejecting Shabir Ali, and they're going to start they're going to start discrediting him and disowning him. Yep, yep, yep. And again, guys, really, you don't know how much I appreciate your prayers because God loves the prayers of His saints. Those who are the body of Christ. Bathe us in prayer, all of us in ministry. God Amen. protect us from Satan, from sin on our flesh, that we don't succumb and shame the Lord. To walk in holiness and purity and worship of our Lord that the Lord will bless our family members and provide financially that we can be sustained and provide for them. Amen. The Lord brings my daughters in my life and ask the Lord for that discipline to keep getting healthier. So my health will not be used of Satan to hinder me and that I will use my health to glorify Christ with it. Today was my cheat day. Boy, did I cheat. <laughs> you got to take advantage of that when you get that cheat day, brother. I got my cheat day at the end of the month. So I got to. Well, I got to do, honestly, I have to do it once a week, brother, because God blessed me that my, Metallism is so fast. If I don't have this cheat day, I'll go down to 170. I'm already in 190s. I want to stay there. I'm hitting the weights to tighten up, not for ego, just so I can stay healthy. I want to be healthy for the Lord and see my girls grow up. Pray for that. And guys, tonight I will play Shabir Ali's own words. He's an apostate. When the Muslims hear this and you make clips out of it, it's over for him. He's not a Muslim. He's an apostate. He's a murtad. He's a munafik. I will document it tonight. The Lord has humiliated this tool of the devil like he humiliated Ahmadidat, made him a vegetable in the bed like a dog who couldn't speak and see and move for 10 years as punishment for his blasphemy. So anyway, God is good. Brother, see you later tonight. God bless, brother. We will be in touch and we'll be doing more shows together soon. Christ Amen. is risen, risen indeed. Take care.